I am Michael Pearl. We're here at the door, and we're going to answer your Bible questions. We've had several people ask similar questions, and uh, so we're going to address the subject tonight, where are the dead? What happens to you when you die? Where's my little girl who died? What about grandmother? What about old Uncle John? Where is he? Uh, are people in heaven or in hell right now? What about the day of judgment? I'm going to draw a picture for you here in a minute and show you. The Bible's very clear on these subjects, and so we're going to give you uh, quite a bit of scripture on it. Now, um, we're going to start off in 2 Corinthians 5 1. Paul says this. He said, if, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, talking about his body, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What he says, if this body dies, I got another body in heaven waiting on me. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with a house which is from heaven. Speaks of the body as a house. So he said, I'm groaning, I'm desiring to get that new body. The older I get, the more decrepit when this gets, the more I agree with Paul. And so be it that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So he says there's a naked state between the time that I lose this body and the time I get my new body, I'm walking around naked, a spirit without a body. Uh, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So he said, when I'm, when I'm groaning, I'm not groaning to enter into that unclothed state between this life and the next one when I'm without a body, but rather I'm looking beyond that to the point where I get my new glorified body. Now he that wrought for us the selfsame thing is God, given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we're always confident, knowing that while we're home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. So Paul said, here I am at home in this physical body, but I'm absent from the presence of the Lord. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So he said, right now I'm absent from God, but I'm here in my body, but I'm ready, I'm confident to be absent from the body and then present with the Lord. So he said, either way that it happens, I'm okay with it. So answering one question, there is a state between now in your natural body and when you get your glorified body when you are a spirit without a body, that's, the, that's, the, that's before the rapture of the church, before Christ comes back in the air, and the bodies are raised from the grave. So my dear old grandmother right now, who loved the Lord, read her Bible every single day, uh, you always see her Bible lying there with a new page open and her wire rim glasses laying on it by the kerosene lantern. Uh, sound like a little house on the prairie, but it was, it was true. Didn't have any electricity. And so she would read her Bible by the kerosene lantern at nighttime. Now my grandmother died. She right now is in God's presence without her body. So she is a spirit in God's presence and she's waiting to be clothed upon with that new body. Whenever the Lord comes back in the air my grandmother is going to rise from the grave. In fact, I, when I attended her funeral, there was a fellow standing there uh, tending to one of the graves, covering it up or something. I don't know. He, he was one of the attendants there. And I walked up to him. I said, do you see that grave over there? And my grandmother, we just buried her. He said, yeah. I said, you keep an eye on that grave because one day it's going to open up. And when it does, my grandmother's going to come out of there. And she's going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And uh, a conversation ensued after that. All right. In Acts 2, 26, therefore did my heart rejoice. My tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will thou suffer than holy one to see corruption. So we're going to kind of be like a detective here and take some of these clues and put them together. This is Christ, a prophecy given in the Psalm that's quoted here in reference to Christ in the book of Acts, that Jesus, that God would not leave Jesus' soul in hell, and he would not allow his flesh to see corruption. So that, that gives us two clues. Number one, that Jesus' body of flesh never rotted in the grave. And number two, that God, that Jesus' soul was in hell, 
during those three days and three nights. So though his soul was in hell, God didn't leave him there. He brought him up out of hell and put him in his new body. Now he was not in the fires of hell. We'll come to this passage on that later. But he was in the domain, jurisdiction, the locale of hell and uh, in a paradise state. Okay, here we are talking about paradise. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So this beggar dies and ends up in a place called Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Two men, two places. One of them goes down to hell. One of them goes down to Abraham's bosom. And he was in torment, the rich man. And he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, in his care, in his love, in his embrace, in his bosom. So there was a place down in the earth where paradise was, and the word paradise only used three times in the Bible, and all three times it's a reference to the place where the saints of God after death are at repose and, uh, and blessing and security. It's a paradise, just like we would use the word. So the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes being in torment. He saw Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. So within sight of Abraham and paradise was a hell where the rich man was suffering the torments of fire. And Abraham said, son, remember you had your good things in your lifetime. Lazarus evil. Now he's comforted. You're tormented. And besides all this between us and you, us in paradise and you in hell, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that those of us who would cross to you cannot, and those of you who'd come from there to us cannot. So he said, there's this big chasm, big gap between us and you. But they're able to communicate across that gap. So I don't know how wide it was. And uh, so I'm going to draw that for you uh, right here. Uh, just enough so you can understand it. So this is the globe. This is the earth right here. And there is, we're going to see the scripture on it. There is a shaft that leads all the way through the earth like this, a pit. If you go in it at one side or go in it at the other side, gravity takes you to the heart of it. And in the heart of it, the middle of the earth is a place called the bottom hell, outer darkness, lake of fire, it's called. Now when, when Lazarus died, he didn't go into this hell. He went into a place called paradise. It was a air conditioned paradise down in this bottomless pit. Now, on the other side of it, the other side of this paradise was a place where the rich man was. He was not yet in the lake of fire, but he was in a place of torment on this other side. And here was this gulf separating them so that those on the paradise side could not cross over and those on the hell side could not cross over to paradise. No one is in the lake of fire yet. Now I'm going to prove all this from scripture. And I just want to uh, get a picture of it in your mind. Now there is no single passage that tells us all of it. But there are several passages that put together causes this to be the only possible solution. So here was Abraham's bosom, the rich man died, was buried, in hell lifted up his eyes. He saw Lazarus so far off, and 
in Abraham's bosom, and they communicated back and forth. All right, here is uh, 1 Peter 4, 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached to them that are dead. So Adam is here, Abel is here, Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, possibly his sons, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David, Solomon, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, all those characters in the Old Testament, plus many, many more, are, were here in paradise at that time. They couldn't go to heaven because their sins hadn't been paid for. But God was favorably disposed to them because they had believed God. So God had a high regard for them in their believing state, but no payment had been made for their sin. It said it was not possible the blood of bulls and goats could take away their sin. So in effect, they were saved on credit. They were saved by God in anticipation of a time when their sins would be paid for. So he says, he, Jesus, when he died, went and preached to the dead. Here's where they were. I'll show you that from Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, 8 through 10, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, this is after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, he ascended up to heaven. He ascended up on high, uh, but uh, he led captivity captive. So there were some people held captive here. He took them out. He captured the, those who were captured and led them out to heaven. He took captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he also distributed gifts to these saints of the Old Testament at that time. Now he that ascended into heaven is he also that descended first into the lower parts of the earth. You can't be any clearer than that. The same Jesus that ascended into heaven is the Jesus who descended first before he ascended into heaven. Now that would have to be between his death and resurrection and his ascension into heaven. That was the time period in which this took place. He descended in the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. You see, with such very specific passages like this and the others I'm reading to you, you see how we come up with this diagram. There's no diagram in the Bible, just these descriptions that are so clear. Now in Luke 23, 42, Jesus uh, said unto Je uh, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now that's, Jesus is on the cross and the, one of the thieves are hanging beside him. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. So by the end of the day, both of them were dead. Jesus was in paradise, which is Abraham's bosom, and that thief on the cross was in paradise. The other thief was in, on the other side in the lake of fire. All it took was for him to request to be remembered by Jesus Christ when he comes into his kingdom. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then we read in Matthew 27, 52, when Jesus died, here's what it says. <laughs> it's fun. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept, that's the word for dead Christians, arose, and came out of the grave after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Matthew 27. So when Jesus went into the grave, on the third day when he came out, bodies of the saints which were previously dead appeared in the city of Jerusalem, unto many people. That means some old lady sitting there grinding her corn and a man walks up to her and says, uh, how you doing there? She says, fine. Who are you? He says, I'm Isaiah. Been a long time since I've been here, about 700 years. And what are you doing here, Isaiah? Well, I'm just waiting. We're going to be going on up to heaven. Just made a stop. So many, many of the saints got to see those Old Testament saints at that time. Now, those are the ones he preached to. 
He didn't preach the gospel to lost people, giving them a chance to get saved. Jesus preached the gospel to those in paradise who were already in a state of grace and favor with God so that they too could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, which they all did. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, 4, he was caught up into paradise, Paul said, and heard unspeakable words which it's not lawful for a man to utter. This is the second usage of the word paradise. Paul got caught up, up, not down. Paradise ceased to be here after Jesus' resurrection. No dead saved people go here anymore. That air-conditioned corridor in hell, that selected, preserved spot, is not there anymore. Paradise has been moved into heaven itself now. And then the question is, and some of you ask, what happens to my children when they die? I had, a, I had some stillborn children. I uh, had one that died in the womb. had uh, uh, one that died three years of age or seven years of age. What happens to my children? Here's what Jesus said about children. Now, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me is better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he were cast into the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. Better to enter into life, halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. See, if you molest children, it's better to cut your wanger off than it is to go to hell with it. If that's what it takes for you to live a straight life, then put the scissors to it. I had a professor in college come hear me preach one time. He said, you shouldn't say that. Somebody will do it. I said, there's several people here who need to. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than have two eyes to be cast into hellfire. You can't stop looking at that child pornography. Put your eyes out. You see, we're talking about eternity here. A little short period of 60, 70, 80 years you live on this planet. We're talking about eternity. You say, I can't quit my sin. You can. There's ways to quit it. Take heed, ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven... Their angels do always behold the face of the Father which is in heaven. So where are the little children? Even though they may have died rough, horrible deaths like those that were killed down in Mexico recently. They are in heaven beholding the face of the Father right now. They're in heaven without their bodies. But they're around the throne of God looking into his face and responding with their mirror neurons in their soul to his expressions of joy and elation at their presence. So he is truly their heavenly father and they are in his presence. Now we won't have time to cover that now, but those same children will come back to the earth, get their bodies and enter into the millennium where the streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing and where a child will live to be 100 years of age, and if he's a sinner at 100 years of age, he'll be executed. If not, he lives out his days on the earth in his natural body for 1,000 years. That's another subject a bit longer. Now, what about the damned? Where are they? Where is hell? Lots of verses on this. Psalm 55, verse 15. Let death seize upon them. Let them go down quick into hell. So it's down. Amos 9, 2. Though they dig into hell. So it is a place you would have to dig down to get to it. Psalm 63, 9. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. Now that's three verses are enough, but I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to inundate you with them. Psalm 86, 13, for great is thy mercy toward me. Thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Proverbs 7, 27, her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. 
bring up a new subject. <clears throat> On the sides of this pit right here, there are little chambers, little cocoon-like structures, little caves, where the unsaved dead are placed like a wasp kills a spider, doesn't actually kill it, and puts it in a little cocoon to preserve it. The unsaved dead are preserved in the sides of the pit because they're going to be raised to stand at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium, and then they'll be cast into the lake of fire. But they're not there now. Right now, they're in the pits, the sides of the pits, the graves on the sides of the pits. I'll give you scripture on that. Uh, chambers of death. Isaiah 14, 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. So he pictures Lucifer going into hell and the dead being, the dead damned being stirred up. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, the noise of thy vows, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. You say, what's the worms? Jesus said when he died in the Old Testament, speaking of him, said, he said, I am a worm and no man. I do believe that in hell, the bodies are going to be burnt away, and what will be left is the essence of the soul, which will be like a worm, like a maggot. How art thou fallen from hell, O Lucifer, son of the mornings? He's talking about the devil there. And he said, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. For 1,000 years, we'll read it, Satan is going to be bound in the sides of this pit for 1,000 years, chained up. All right, we're coming to Ezekiel 31, 15. He said he would come down to the grave, in 31, 15, 16, I, make, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell that descended into the pit. There's your pit again. Into the nether parts of the earth, lower parts of the earth. Down into hell, he said again. 18, nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. So he's talking about them lying. So they are, another clue, the damned are lying in cocoons, corridors, graves on the sides of the pit. <clears throat> Amos 9, 2, though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them, and they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So, Here's two directions, up to heaven, down to hell. Very clear. Eternal fire. There is an eternal fire. I don't like to talk about this. I've only preached a couple of messages on hell in my life. I couldn't go to sleep. I uh, don't like preaching about it. In fact, I'd like to discuss it with God. Uh, I don't agree with him on it. I, I know he's right, but I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I can't see that, you know. It just doesn't ring with me. I, I, I wouldn't. I would destroy people. I wouldn't leave them in hell forever and ever. I mean, that's me. But there's, apparently there's something when God created man and put his life, God put his life into us, there's something there he can't destroy. We have part of God in us, and it's eternal, and he can't kill it. And so the unsaved are confined into a place of torment forever and ever. Maybe the bodies are burned up, uh, like I said, into the worm, but the, the soul does not cease to exist and torments forever. He says this, Mark 9, 45, If thy foot offend thee, cut it off, is better for thee to enter into life having two feet than to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. That's pretty strong, the fire that never shall be quenched. Revelation 20, verse 1, speaks of this bottomless pit. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottom of his pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. Now, why is this pit called the bottomless pit? 
All right, picture something falling into a mass with gravitational pull based on the, the, the mass. And something falls in here, it would reach the center point of the mass, and then it would gyrate, but it wouldn't hit bottom. If it came in at this side, it likewise would fall to the center and gyrate, but it wouldn't hit bottom. It's a bottomless pit. It's called outer darkness because there's no oxygen there. It's called a lake of fire because it's a lake with all banks. No up, everything is contained inside the lake. So all the Bible terminology fits perfectly the physical structure of, as I've drawn it here. Cast in the bottomless pit, shut a seal upon him, and he says, <clears throat> He won't be released until the thousand years are finished, and the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. The rest of the dead. That's the unsaved dead. That's my Uncle Pat. He won't live again until the thousand years are finished. Uncle Pat was a wife cheating, lying, drunkard who put a gun in his mouth and blew his brains out. My Uncle Pat is in the sides of the pit right now. He's going to be raised, stand before God and give an account, and then he'd be cast into the lake of fire. This, he said, the rest of the dead will live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection which occurs before the thousand years. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. This is the second death. First death is physical. Soul is raised, joins the body, and is killed again and cast into hell. When the thousand years expired, Satan should be loosed out of his prison. He should go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, so forth, so forth. Fire came down from God out of heaven and destroyed them. The angel that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is after the thousand years. To be cast into the lake of fire and tormented, here it is, day and night, forever and ever. I don't like reading that. That's the ugliest thing I've ever read in my life. That's the grossest, most horrible thing I can ever imagine. I can't even imagine it. I read it. I believe it because God says it. But tormented day and night, forever and ever. I'd scare the hell out of me if I wasn't saved. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead for which were in it, and death and hell, death, the grave up here, and hell here. Death and hell deliver up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is your name in the book of life? If it's not, that's what awaits you. Now, let's discuss this thing sides of the pit. This is freaky. Ezekiel 32, 18, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt. He said he will bring them down to the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. Go down and thou will be laid with the uncircumcised. The strong among the mighty shall speak to them out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down. They lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. They're lying down in hell. They're not walking around. They're in these graves. Verse 23, whose graves, here it is, are set in the sides of the pit. And her company is round about her grave. So he's talking about these damned of Egypt are there and their cohorts are with them in graves surrounding them. You know, a lot of people make fun, laugh about hell and uh, where are you going to? Where are you going? I'm going to hell if I don't change my ways, somebody says. I think that's cute. Well, you know, when you and your buddies, you're drinking buddies, you're fornicating buddies, when you're stuffed into a little tight compartment and the fires and smoke and cinders of hell 
and your friends are stuck in there with you around here and close by, and you can hear their moans and groans and their pleading for a drop of water to be placed on their tongue, you're not going to be cool anymore. There is Elam and her multitude round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised into the nether parts of the earth. Go down into the pit. Go down into the pit, he says again and again. Isaiah 14, 33. Brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Uh, and Isaiah 14, 19. <clears throat> Go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden underfoot. Now, that's not all the scripture. And as you see, there's an abundance of scripture on the subject. Have you read your Bible all the way through? Then don't be surprised because it's been there all the time. Now, Revelation 20, verse 15, this will be our final passage. Excuse me, there's Two, yeah, one final passage here in Revelation 20. The rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open. Another book is open, which is the book of life. They were judged of those things. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. So where are the dead? If, if it's a child who not reached an age of accountability, then they're in God's presence without a body right now, <clears throat> uh, enjoying his smile. If it's a Old Testament saint who believed God, who then responded to that gospel message when Jesus came down into the paradise, and upon leaving he took these out and carried them with him into heaven, where they're now in his presence, just like the Apostle Paul is, without their natural bodies. They're waiting the day when they'll get their glorified bodies. And so right now there is a throng in heaven, but it might be a quiet place, you know. It's, there's no celebration there yet. Worship, yes, but worship like you worship in your dreams, maybe. Uh, it, it's, they are not, they don't have their mansions yet. They're not walking down the golden streets yet. They're not picking the fruit from the tree of life. They're not having a big dance. They are waiting, consciously present, holding <laughs> their breath if they could breathe, anticipating Christ's return back. I imagine they, you know, and spirits can see, and I imagine they see Jesus walk over to his white horse and pet him, and they say, maybe it's now. They see him put on his sword, his lightsaber, just testing it out. So he's getting ready. And they see angels group up and come riding by on white horses and think, is that for us? Because they know that when he comes back, they're going to be coming back with him. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Those which are dead in Christ, those which are dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain shall rise up with them to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we evermore be with the Lord. So <clears throat> he said, and the saints he'll bring with him. Even Enoch testified. Enoch, that's like uh, before, most, uh, before the flood. That's like 3000 B.C. Enoch testified and he said, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, millions of his saints. So and that's in the book of Jude, quoted in the book of Jude. So Jesus, when he comes back, will come back in the air with the saints with him, caught up together, we'll all meet together in the air, and then seven years later, we'll come back with him all riding white horses. And he will conquer the earth. There'll be 1,000 years when Satan is bound up. Children will have a response, chance to grow to maturity, those who died, and respond to the gospel. And at the end of that 1,000 years, the great white throne judgment will take place where the unsaved dead who've been in the horrors of hell will be raised and get their filthy, dirty, depraved bodies. And they won't be young and lovely. They'll be in the ragged thing. They'll be zombies. 
and then they'll be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And that'll be the end of them. And then the earth, the Bible said, will be destroyed. They'll, he said there'll be no place found for it. It won't cease to exist, but it will be, it'll melt with a fervent heat. The elements will melt with a fervent heat, he says. It'll be destroyed and no place found for it. It'll be a wandering in the universe. And a new heavens and a new earth will be created right here where this one sits. A brand new earth, spanking new, no sin on it. Won't be any chance of somebody stumbling across a porno magazine buried somewhere in a bunker a million years from now. Won't be any chance of somebody coming across an old CD or some other kind of filth. Uh, no disease. It'll all be conquered. Be a new heaven, a new earth. And that will commence eternity. So that's the answer. Where are the dead?